Okay, well, good morning and welcome to the Talk Tuesday today, February 23rd, 2021. Um, the subject of our talk today is read, keys to helping your child become a lifelong reader. And my name is Sherry Lajwa. I'm the Director of Language at the American School of Dubai. And I'm excited to be here with uh, Lori Fisher, my colleague and co-presenter, who's a literacy coach supporting uh, student learning and, and teacher learning from grade, uh, from middle, middle elementary and middle school, as well as, as, as the system. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning and uh, for uh, being with us as we share our passion um, as lifelong readers and uh, and our passion in supporting um, all children to become um, lifelong readers. So our objective today is to deepen understanding of the power of, of read alouds. And, and we want to do this, we'll do this through, um, through our presentation and our discussion. Um, we'll have a couple of activities in the chat box and we invite you, uh, if at any time during the presentation you have questions, to please drop those in the, the Q&A box and we will return to the questions at the end of our presentation. So as all things we do in education and certainly at the American School of Dubai, we wanna anchor this conversation in evidence-based practices. So what does the research say around reading? We know that reading is, is complex. We know that there's no magic formula for learning to read. There's a predictable developmental sequence um, and there are you know, specific stages in literacy. And I'm, I'm just going to, that's not the focus of this um, presentation necessarily, but I just to, um, be aware of it. There's the, the emergent pre-reader stage from like six months to six years, the novice reader stage from around the ages of six and seven, decoding stage seven to nine, um, fluent comprehending reader from nine to 15, and then the expert reader from the ages of 16 and beyond. So we'll speak today to, to share some tips around how to uh, how important it is for, for reading for all ages. And not all children will learn to read at the same time or the same pace. It's, um, as I said, complex. It, it takes time. It takes practice. It's like learning to ride a bike. You need to keep practicing and practicing. And, but most, most critically is the role of, in, of adults, um, teachers, um, parents, family, in, in developing the reader's life. I want to begin with this quote from Stephen Krashen. Stephen Krashen uh, was a, is, a, is a linguist. He did a lot of work in the 70s and 80s around um, re language acquisition, second language acquisition. And then in, in the 90s, he moved to the Faculty of Education of the University of Southern California. And he has a lot of, uh, well, let me just cut to the, <laughs> the, the quote. When children read for pleasure, when they get hooked on books, they acquire involuntarily and without conscious effort, nearly all of the so-called language skills many people are so concerned about. They will become adequate readers, acquire a large vocabulary, develop the ability to understand and use complex grammatical constructions, develop a good writing style and become good, but not necessarily perfect spellers. Although free voluntary reading alone will not ensure attainment of the highest levels of, of literacy, it will at least ensure an acceptable level. And without it, I suspect the children simply do not have a chance. And so Stephen Krashen's later work was um, really around promoting the use of, of free voluntary reading or developing um, a love of reading, a reading for pleasure in children. And he said that this was the most important or the most powerful tool that we have in language education, both first and second. I'm not, it helps. So what does ASD say? Our mission guides all of the work we do. We challenge and inspire each student to achieve their dreams and to become a passionate learner 
prepared to adapt and contribute in a rapidly changing world. <clears throat> So today we were taking the, the approach, we're going to share with you an acronym for READ as we share, present some ideas of how to develop and support um, lifetime readers. And we'll talk about creating rituals or routines. We'll talk about nourishing the, the environment as well as accessing um, the thinking and, and skills in reading and dialoguing around the reading. So we just have a short um, video to begin. So just enjoy this and then we'll have a, I'll share some thoughts about it. What do you have there? It's a book. Do you scroll down? Nope. I turn the page. It's a book. Can you blog with it? No. It's a book. Well, can it tweet? No. Can it text? Can it Wi-Fi? Does it need a password? No. Can it do this? No. It's a book. Hmm. Are you going to give it back? No, but I'll charge it up when I'm done. You don't have to. It's a book! Eileen Smith. Sorry. What do you have there? Thank you, Sherry. So um, just in that short book that was shared through video, my curiosity really peaks about why the character didn't want to give that book back and what was in that book and that he spent those hours looking through that. Um, although now we read books in a variety of formats, younger children learn so many things and reading skills um, with how to handle a book, what the cover tells us, how we read from left to right, um, and in some languages, how we read the opposite. What information can we gain from the pictures and text features? Um, I love this short story um, and I'm and really intrigued by the character that does not want to give that book back. And it really, I think, shows us that a book is never just a book. It's always a lot more and there's so much inside. You can do the next slide. What do you so in this slide, just a quote from Dr. Seuss that says, you're never too old, too wacky, too wild to pick up a book and to read to a child. I would also say that we're never too old to have someone read to us. So just three quotes there and um, you can just read those, but I want you to think for just a minute back to a time as a child or in your teens that you had a book read to you, either by a teacher, a parent, um, a sibling, um, and just share in the chat if you would like the book that you remember being read to, having been read to you, and maybe something you enjoyed about it. So I'll just share why you're thinking about that for a minute. I remember so much when I was in third grade, a book that was read to me. It was The Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. And in that book, um, sure, can you go back? Sorry. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's okay. It's not important. Um, I remember that book being read to me. And I think the thing I remember the most is I'd never been exposed to that genre before. And I also just remember my teacher's voice. It happened right after lunch and her voice was soothing. And it, it was just a special time for me. So if you'd like, um, just stick something in the chat and we can go on to the next slide. Thank you, Sherry. I'm actually looking for the chat. I'm not seeing it again. There we go, chat. And that's okay, we can go on and um, also just 
considering the idea we are never too old to be read to. Um, the quote says, we do not age out of read alouds. If we did, the audio book industry would not be thriving and it is a thriving industry. So we can kind of think about some of the voices that we love um, that, that read to us. It could be like a parent, it could be remembering um, something else that was read to us. But even as adults, I can think about like Morgan Freeman when he narrates um, March of the Penguins or uh, some other books, like just his voice is just soothing to me. I recognize that. And I have audio books um, or podcasts, um, well, um, that I read and like you can think about the voice of Renee Brown, just those voices that are really soothing and um, just kind of bring some enjoyment when we're listening to them. And audiobooks when you're on a long drive or a trip in a car, um, just give us an enormous amount of pleasure. So we wanted to break down the, some, the acronym READ and we're starting with the, the R being a ritual or routines might be an, um, a way to conceive, think of this as well, developing a routine for reading in your home. So good readers have home environments that support literacy learning. This statement is one of, of several in the PEARLS summary, and this particular summary is from 2016. So PEARLS is the, um, PEARLS is the Progress in International Reading Literacy Study. And it's a study that's con uh, conducted worldwide. Um, and it's in its 20th year this year. It's, it, it tests grade four students on, um, on a variety of, of reading and reading comprehension skills. And ASD has participated in this uh, uh, assessment in the past. And we are set to also participate again this uh, March in our grade four, we have a sample of grade four students that will be participating in the PEARLS this year. So across the, the data that PEARLS has collected over at this point, it would have been um, 16 years that they've conducted the study, has shown that across countries, higher reading achievement was related to more home resources that support learning. Example is books in the home, study supports, more digital devices in the home, and parents who like to read. Further to establishing the ritual or the routine for reading, it's important to try to find or to find time in, in your day for reading. Um, and it's not that you need to you know, replace um, the activities that your children are involved in. It's not to replace soccer or sleepovers or TV time, but to enhance some of the time you have with your children by engaging in reading. So maybe it's going to be a bedtime reading. Maybe uh, you can read to your children when they're, bat when they're in the bath, if it's, if it's younger children. Um, in my family, uh, reading at the breakfast table was, was something we all did together where a dinner table was not the time to pull books out in front of, in for us. Finding a place to read, um, we'll speak a little bit more about that on environment, but any place is a good place to read. You can read in the bedroom, you can read in any room in your house, you can read in the park, you can read in the car on road trips. But a part of the routine is establishing that everyone reads and modeling that, um, that, it, that everyone reads for pleasure. And that, again, you're never too old to read or be read to. And Laurie mentioned the potential for podcasts on road trips as the whole family listens to the same story and, and can engage in conversations about that. In addition to shared reading, it's also important to, courage, to encourage your child to read independently. And the students can bring home 10 library books a week. That may be a source of, of um, the books that, that they're engaging in reading. And we will also get in a little further into the conversations around what is being read and making this a part of the routine. And we also want to acknowledge that repetition is okay. I, I think all of us as parents um, might have been a little exasperated bored when our children wanted to read the same story every night before bed. And if you know, if you changed it up or missed a piece, it was like, that's not how it goes. Um, but repetition is okay. Children, children, 
they engage in every repetition in a different way. Maybe one time they're focusing on one thing, the next time they're going to take something away. But that security of knowing what's coming next also helps them to build um, their literacy skills. And then as we move to the environment, so reading to children at home or at school, and, and reading at school is certainly a part of, of um, what children do, it leads to them, them to associate reading with pleasure and provides them with models for reading. And I want to also come back to Stephen Krashen's um, work at the beginning is that it's important for children to develop um, reading for pleasure. In terms of the environment, I want to, <laughs> I wanted, I want to um, invite you also in the chat box to, so I'm going to go back to this slide. I would like you to, in the chat box, enter um, some of your ideas around what you can do to set up uh, a reading environment or a reading friendly environment in your in in your home or in your in your life. I'm going to take just a two or three minutes to enter some ideas in the chat and then we will come back to this conversation. I would just like to reiterate, I invite you to share how you can create a literacy rich uh, or prepare the environment in your home or in your, your child's life that inspires reading or makes reading easily accessible. I'm not sure if, um, if there's anything in the chat, so I, I will go on to the next slide. So some of the ideas we, we offer for setting up our literacy rich environment is, is to set up an environment that reflects a value for literacy. Uh, are there, is there a spot in your house that, that's a, your child's library? Are there books of laying around in different places of your house? Are books accessible where students can, can have easy access to them? Enjoy reading and its challenges. And, and in this sense, challenges, they're challenging, not challenge in the sense that it's struggle, although sometimes it is a struggle and, and we need to work through those, but opportunities to engage more deeply in, in the book. Maybe um, encourage students to participate in some of the um, book club offers that are, are happening in the community or in the school. And another thing that's important in the in the environment is to establish some screen free time. It's often easier for children after their busy day to um, be passive consumers of screens, um, videos and games. But sometimes we need to say, um, this is screen free time. And maybe you should pick up or maybe you can pick up a book and then dig into the book. It's also become a little more complicated in these times because often our books are on the screen that we want to read. And so it's not so much that this is screen free time, screen free time, but that it's a time is made um, available for the children to read and to disengage from the passive con consummation of, of videos. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not like articulating that well. I'm not saying that that's bad, but part of the environment is to is to create the time um, to engage in literacy activities. I just want to share um, a scholastic survey that was taken in 2019. Really, in this, I'm going to talk about access. I'm going to talk about access to books in three different ways. One of the things I want to talk about in access is access to that family time and to our child. So in this scholastic survey, overwhelmingly, the parents and the children said one of the most important things about this read aloud time or shared reading time was it's a special time with each other a time that we can begin at birth and we can carry on for years into our children's lives while we have access creating that time that's treasured in the family, a bonding time and a time that you have 
a shared experience. There's a quote from a 17 year old boy that says, it was quality one-on-one -on -one time with my parents. And I have special memories of picking out books they would read with me. I'm also gonna share just a personal story when in 2010, one of my children was going off to the university and he had you know, finished the grueling work that high school brings, um, AP exams, all of those kind of things were complete. And his university sent a message to say, we would like all freshmen incoming to read this book so we have a shared experience when they arrive on campus. And um, that wasn't really interesting um, to my particular child. So we kind of ignored that. Um, we got him settled in his dorm and about three days into his university experience, he called me and it's so vivid the memory. I remember I was in a parking lot of a supermarket. I answered my phone and he said, mom, I have the book they told us to read. You have got to go buy a copy. It's amazing. Please read chapter one by tomorrow so we can have a conversation about what you think and what you see about these characters. So even with my 18 year old at the time, still that shared dialogue, those experiences, what characters are doing, creates just a huge bonding experience and um, that that's so vivid in my memory and took place 11 years ago that I can even remember where we had the conversation about get the book. Um, and then he has some really vivid memories about our conversations, why we separately um, read the book, but jointly shared um, our thoughts about characters and the plot development and the theme. Sorry. So I also just want to talk about access and, and access this way. I want to talk about read anything um, with your child. Comics, if they're interested in it, graphic novels, joke books, riddles, recipes, songs, any of those things count as reading. I also put a couple of other things in there. I, I kind of have some books. Um, I have um, just even reading before you watch a movie together. What do the critics say about it? What do they suggest? And then at the end of the movie, did you agree with that critic, what the critics said? Did you not agree with it? Also enjoyed the time at restaurants. Sometimes when you order food and your children are at various ages, they get a little impatient for their food. So we would spend time reading the menu. There's so much text in there and expanding vocabulary with that. Like, what does that mean? Um, what do you think ghost pepper sauce is? Whatever that might be. So I just have a little Buffalo Wild Wings um, menu in there, but there's so much text inside of that. One of the nice things now is you can take a picture of that on the phone and um, just with what COVID brings, don't necessarily have to um, touch that menu. There's also just print everywhere in our environment. Um, there's billboards, there's road signs. We have maps, all of those kind of things have text on them um, and are fun to read. Another great thing with your older children um, or you could decide the age, but reading while you watch a foreign film and reading those subtitles, maybe deciding I'm going to read what this character says and you're gonna read what this does and changing those voices out, but there's so much text in that. And then eventually you can not read it aloud, but um, I like a quote that I found. It says, once you overcome the one inch tall barrier of subtitles, you're going to be introduced to so many more amazing films. So there's so many things out there that maybe we can't access because it's not our native language, um, but being able to read those subtitles um, does that. Also, I think Sherry mentioned, although it can seem like not that book again, sometimes giving kids choice. And that 17 year old talked about the joy that he had with being able to choose the book. So finding what captivates your child and really exploring that together, if it's captivating to them and they want that graphic novel series, book after book, what is it that they find interesting? And it really lets you have a conversation with that book as a third point about what their interests are, um, what their thinking is like, um, all of those desires. So it's just such a great time for communication when you read aloud to your child with that, or you have a shared reading time that I'm going to read, you're going to read, and then we're going to have some discussion. So access, um, just thinking about anywhere you see print, it's a time to read. I'll share one more, like just personal story. When I took my other child to the university, we were driving to her campus and she and I were in one car um, and the others of our family were in another car because we had so much stuff to take. And when we were 
going on our journey. We we're on the highway. And she said, mom, I read last night that how much you were read to as a child is a huge predictor of how you're going to do at the university. And she said, what if you didn't read to me enough? And so I said, well, we can make up for that. Um, we have three hours on the road. So then jokingly and laughingly, every time we passed a billboard, a sign, um, anything, a mile marker, a road sign, I read them out loud to her. And um, we enjoyed that time together and just laughed and thinking that, um, although I probably didn't do when, that when she was growing up, everywhere around us is print and words and things that we can read, discussions we can have. I notice oftentimes in Dubai, when I'm driving on the highway, I see things about the expo coming and um, a great conversation to, um, where's that now? And what do you think that's gonna look like? Um, there's print everywhere. All right. And then I'm gonna talk about access in what access children have when we read aloud to them. Um, we can think about the places that they can go that maybe we never will actually visit or the access that they have to text that maybe is not yet at their ability to read. So reading aloud gives access to the transformative power of stories. Stories can change us. They can help us experience things that we would never experience. They can take us on journeys and lands um, that we would never visit. Um, and they can help us feel things that characters feel that maybe we don't feel inside ourselves. When um, students are read aloud to or children are read, aloud, are read aloud to, it also helps them access and deeply understand text. By that, it's the dialogue that you have the conversations that you have about what characters are thinking or what are the deep underlying themes. It also gives children access to get inside and access a story without dealing with the whole code of decoding and what word comes next. And what I'm going to say, it, um, if a parent is reading aloud, the parent is taking care of that decoding word. They're managing tricky words um, and they're able to stop with complex vocabulary and have conversations or explain what that word means. So it eliminates all of the skill of reading for a child and lets a child just enjoy that reading and that time with their parents. So that's a completely different kind of access. So we have access to where we can find print and then how they can access things that are inside a book, themes, characters, those kind of things. And then dialogues. So talk a little bit about our final um, letter of our acronym READ, and that's just dialogue, which is the rich part of sharing conversations with your child. The quote says, conversations matter. Talking with children provides them experiences that are important to both their cognitive and their social emotional learning. So in thinking about that, I don't know if with your children, sometimes you said, what did you do at school today? They're like nothing or it was fine or not much. And the answers are short. And as they get older, trying to carve out that time to really find out what they're thinking and how they're feeling just becomes a little bit trickier. They have less that sometimes they want to share or if their feelings are hurt, they're gauging, am I gonna share this with my parents or am I not? So sometimes a book is such a great place to have a conversation point around. Um, it can be about what is that character feeling? What does that think? And it can all rely about the story, the plot, the character. And then you can slip in those things like, have you ever felt that way? Was there a time? Or sharing a little bit about yourself, like saying, I remember when I was 13 and this happened. Or if there's something in there, um, thinking about Junie B. Jones books and all of the silly things that she did. Is there something in your life or their life that maybe they can relate to with those books? So a shared reading time or a parent reading aloud really opens that dialogue opportunity. So part of pleasure in the read, Part of the pleasure in reading the story is derived from the shared experience of the reader and the listener. They may discuss the stories that goes along. They may spend time on the illustrations, if there are any, and they may flick back to check details they have previously overlooked. And just in the reading of the story, the job of the reader is so much more than just reading. The words, what voices they use for the characters, and how much they allow the descriptions to resonate. 
all make an enormous difference to the way the listener will feel about the story. And when our younger children are spending time decoding, um, not that it's not important, it's hugely important that they also read aloud to you. They need that practice. But sometimes um, they're worried about like, what is that word? Or um, we go through stages where it sounds a little bit more robotic. And that's a great time that you can model and share with them. I'm gonna use a little bit different voice because I think this character sounds a little bit grumpy. Then you can have a conversation. Did I sound like that? What were you thinking? Um, and sometimes it's about the pause where when we read the text, we're like, well, that was an important point. Just gonna pause for a minute so that can resonate. And maybe a time to have a short conversation and a dialogue, or maybe just to say, why do you think I stopped right there? What are you thinking right now? So all of those things um, come into play when we have short dialogues about the books that are being read. So I just have a few books and I'm not sure if you can see the titles I have. When I look at my slide, our pictures are on top of them, but I'll share that. So I'm not sure if yours looks just like mine, but in dialogue, I just have some ideas that I wanna share with you. Um, and I'll just bring an analogy to it. Sometimes um, when we're gonna think about going to a movie and we might have a conversation after that movie and the talk that we have about a movie would be like, I can't believe it when they, or did you notice what that character did? I don't agree at all with the choices that made or I thought, and it's so easy to have those conversations after we watch something together because it's been vivid, it's come alive and um, we're having that conversation right away. So books are the same thing. I think sometimes we um, think about, well, what just happened? What was the character's name? Where was the setting? Kind of those basic things. But in this dialogue, I just invite you to consider kind of deeper things. I'm um, discussing big ideas about the world, lives of others, sharing a little bit about ourselves if it comes in there, sharing, oh, I went to that country one time or I've never been there or I've not been to a farm or on the ranch I used to, whatever it is. And again, pausing to think and kind of wondering aloud, why do you think that character did that? Um, were you concerned when? Have you ever seen someone do that? And then even talking about how the stories affect us. How does it make you feel? Um, dialoguing about a story gives us an opportunity to model compassion. We can share, well, that must be difficult for that character to have felt that way. Or, well, they really struggled when they did those things. What do you think that disability might be like? We get the opportunity to read about characters who are vastly different than ourselves, or we might see a glimpse of ourselves in, our, in a character to say, you know, sometimes I do that too. Or when I'm a little cranky, I remind myself of um, Junie B. Jones, just sharing that. It's also an opportunity to share your personal values with your child as you explore the theme of a story or the traits of a character. Sometimes they don't want to just hear, well, I think this, I think this, but when you're reading a story and we find those values that are personal to us that we really want to impart in our child, that book gives us a point to share that. Also thinking about books that, what does history show us? What might the future be like? What can we learn from the past? And a book gives a great opportunity to do that too. So I just kind of have three books on here and I'll just share a little bit about each of them. I have the book um, Jacket of Where Redford Grows. And um, that's just an exciting story to draw us into a boy's life whose passion and perseverance can give us hope. We can share that with our child. And then in the end of that story, we find it's okay to cry together. There might be something that moved us so much. Um, the award-winning book Mighty Miss Malone transports us back to the depression era, an era that we have not lived in. And we can see how a family that uses their talents and um, their skills and their perseverance um, and clings to hope for what they're trying to accomplish. In the book, um, Be Who You Are, it's a great read to just say that we're all different, we're all unique. We all have something to bring and it's okay. So in that book, as each page talks about be who you are, is a great conversation or dialogue starting point to say, I'm like this, or I'm not like this, or do you know someone that's like this, or how do you feel? And just so much dialogue can be in a short read also. Also wanna share, don't be reluctant to repeat books 
or to repeat series if um, that's what they're interested in. In our blurb that um, invited to you to this conversation, we talked about finding books that are captivating. And we do have to find books that captivate our children. Finding books with great characters, great storylines, amazing illustrations can keep the whole family captivated. In my um, the story I told you about taking my child to the university and, and him calling me to say, mom, go buy this book. We were captivated. We couldn't wait to get to the next chapter. And I find my, found myself, even though we agreed, okay, you read this much tonight and we'll talk tomorrow. I found myself, even as the mom wanting to sneak ahead and see what was gonna happen in that book. Um, and I think that's a great place for our children to be that they're so excited about reading. There's some books that we think sometimes have value that they're classics and we want our children to know about it. But if your child is interested in graphic novels and comic books or any of those kind of things that captivate them, there is opportunity for dialogue and conversation. And if they're whatever book they're eager to pick up and share with you, um, just invite you to have that be the book that you share. So included a title of um, an Arabic book that won an award, reminding us all of that, um, especially if you speak multiple languages or if you speak two languages to read books that are in your native tongue or in a tongue that if, you're, if you have the ability that your child is learning at school um, and having those conversations about those words in that dialogue. The last book I want to just share a little bit and just thinking about, we have some books maybe that are in our homes or that sit on our shelves that really span multiple ages for what our children are ready for. And the book, The Giving Tree is just an example of a book that has so many layers. It can be read multiple ages, multiple times, and the dialogue each time can be completely different. In reading this book to a three-year-old, it's a short book, and we can talk about trees that we see and trees that are in the world and what the boy is thinking. Um, in this book, if we're reading it a little bit later in time with our child, um, like a 10 year old, we can start to talk about, well, what do you think about that? What do you think made him act that way? How did you feel about the ending of that story? Was there something that made you sad? Why do you think the boy did the things that he did? Um, is it good or is it bad? And then thinking about that book with a 17 year old, there's so many deep underlying themes that could be drawn out of that book to even share and read that book again and just say, what is the main theme? What do you really think Shel Silverstein was trying to say? Was he trying to show us the good? Was he trying to show us the bad? Is there something um, in here that's disturbing or is there something in here that's very comforting? So that's a book that just has multiple, multiple layers that can be a treasured book that can be enjoyed um, at different ages for different purposes. This brings us to, um, so, uh, to share with you some of the access our students have to reading materials. Of course, they have the elementary school library. And as I said, every class visits the library, I believe once a week. Um, and they can bring home 10 different books. And they're always encouraged to bring home um, different books, picture books, different interests. Uh, we have a considerable collection of books in Arabic as well. In our elementary school library, we have 35 thousand plus books as well as a thousand over a thousand ebooks and subscriptions to numerous um, numerous uh, magazines that students can can borrow in the UAE I think that we're very privileged to have many opportunities and and um, I understand that in 2016 it was the year of reading in the UAE and there was much writing about um, that there was a literacy crisis particularly in the Arab world and, and the lack of, uh, or there was some promotion of the importance of reading also in Arabic to develop literacy skills in Arabic. Um, the Sharjah Book Fair, oh, I'm missing something here. It's a book fair. The Sharjah Book Fair that takes place in November and currently the Emirates Lit Fest is taking place now. And although this year it doesn't have the same accessibility, we're not taking students to hear authors speak. We have still subscribed and those 
presentations have been recorded and our students and teachers are accessing those recordings in, to meet the authors and understand how they came to develop their stories and, and read the stories together. This year, we, uh, as a school, subscribe to Kutubi, which is an Arabic reading platform. And, and I know that the Arabic teachers, especially, I believe it at all three levels, assign students particular readings to read. Now, those have been assigned by the teacher, so they may not be the book of choice that the student picks up to develop their pleasure of reading, but it, it's another access point. Students are free to explore anywhere in that Kutubi platform other books that may interest them that, that they can choose to read and, and to read with you. And then there's two authors um, that have written books, um, really helpful books about the whole subject of family reading, um, giving you everything from book list themes to ideas about what shared family reading time might be like. So those might be authors that you might want to look into and see if their books available, if that might, um, be some be a support for you as you consider read aloud time for different ages. Um, Sarah McKenzie also has several podcasts. Um, you just Google Sarah McKenzie and there she is just in variety of ways with podcasts and different information about questions to ask, dialogue, um, wordless picture book how to use a picture book um, with your 15 year old. So she just has a, a, just a vast array of different topics. So that might be a resource that you might want to consider. We also included a link for Read Aloud America. Read Aloud America puts out a suggested read aloud book list every year. So the 2021 one is out and it's a pretty extensive list. One thing that's really nice about that list is it breaks it down for age group. It'll have birth to three, clear up to 17 to 19 year olds and talks about kind of the family reading time and giving book suggestions. And of course, you know, we have to preview and read and look at those books just to make sure everything in there aligns with things that, that we would want to explore as a family, but, but those are great resources. brings us to, uh, we invited you in the beginning to submit any questions you may have in the Q&A. So we'll just take some a minute to see if there are questions there. So this is the contact slide that Laurie mentioned. So my name, uh, I'm there and Laurie is there. And then we've included as well, Julie Jones, the elementary librarian, Jason Roach, the middle school librarian, Jennifer Belts, high school librarian. They are amazing resources to uh, support your child's development of the, of the love of reading. I do wanna go back as a summary of, um, of, our, of our time together. We hope that this, uh, this our talking through our passion of developing the rituals and the routines for reading, um, nourishing the environment, the print environment it, accessible to your child, accessing both physically accessing reading materials as well as accessing the thinking and the unpacking of, of the reading and the dialogue around the reading that you may be carrying away a few tips or strategies or uh, suggestions that you are ready to engage in with your child. It is important to read and it's only recently been um, the conversations around understanding the importance of reading in, in your home language. And, and not just any language, obviously you can't read in Russian. If you can't read in Russian, you're not reading in Russian. But if you have a home language that is uh, not the school language, it, it, the importance of the development of literacy in your home language, those uh, underlying literacy skills um, serve the ch all children well in developing, continuing to develop their literacy skills in their school language, in which in our case is English. Laurie spoke to the multiple sources uh, for reading materials and again to the any genre. Um, what, we, what we're aiming for here is developing the pleasure of reading and creating lifetime readers in, in our students. Because the research also shows us that the students that have those strong literacy skills um, will continue to do well in the school environment. 
So at this point, as Laurie said, if there are questions in the question, there are still no questions in the Q&A box. So we do invite you to reach out to contact us if you have any questions and if we can support you in any way. Thank you very much for taking your time to be with us today and um, happy reading. Have a wonderful day.